This is kind of one of those words that um, is actually for, for me, for you, and it, it's not for you to go, gee, I wish, you know, my husband was here or my wife was here or I'm going to send that on to someone. It's actually for us. And so um, usually I've got like one title, but I really couldn't decide what, what to name it. Was it to talk about the sacrificial life or was it to talk about are you a contributor? But it kind of is all of those sort of things. And then, you know, unusually we just sang Worthy is the Lamb um, during uh, communion and, and through the different things that we've done. And so I want to talk about our Christian walk and how sacrificial it is and whether it is for you and whether you feel like you're contributing. And, and I'm going to liken it a lot to a marriage. So if you're not married here uh, today, you might be like, phew, but I want you to think about if you're ever planning on getting married, then you need to take these things on board to be, to be thinking. Because when we come into Christianity, uh, the whole aim is that um, although we're, we are saved by grace and, and Christ has paid the whole price, but we are then supposed to contribute into this thing we are supposed to live a sacrificial life and so a lot through the word of god it relates to a marriage as well and i think it's very similar because when i look at people that are struggling in their christian walk to live a sacrificial life to live a life where they're contributing often it's very similar into um, a marriage situation that we are we're finding it very hard to contribute into that we're finding it hard to live a sacrificial life and so I think one of my concerns is that people do not realise when you enter into a marriage that it's about a sacrificial life uh, from your point of view, not theirs. <laughs> just let me clarify that. So it's like, yeah, I knew that all the time. They, they just, you know. But it's about us living a sacrificial life and uh, to do that. And our Christianity is the same. And so, you know, again, I'm very uh, aware we don't want to come on a Sunday and then just, oh, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? You know, just come say a prayer. And, uh, you know, because I want you to understand that when you become a Christian, it's about laying down your life and it's about living a sacrificial life. And so... Um, in our marriage, it's going to be the same. I heard someone recently say in a counselling situation, uh, they were talking about how you choose, how you uh, work with people in a counselling situation, and they said this, I'm as invested as you are. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's a very powerful statement, where I'm as invested as you are. And so I want you to think about your life with Christ, and maybe if you're married, your marriage, to, to your side to it. Am I a contributor or am I a consumer? Okay, because we need to think a lot about, you know, our Christianity and about laying down our lives. And, and when we don't understand what it is to make a sacrifice, then I think we just, you know, get things. Even for other things in our life, maybe it's different things that you do. One of the things that we do at this church now, Pastor Tom will only marry people who are a member of our church. And to get married in our church, you have to go through um, a course. I think it's about 16 weeks and sometimes that might seem like, wow, that's a really long time. But our aim was to try and make sure that you really understood what it meant when you made those decisions. And I'd probably say in the last 30 odd years, I've never found anyone that's struggling in their marriage or even split up, that the reality is whatever the, the issue is, that that wasn't the issue when you first got married. Or actually, let me say, before you got married. Uh, but we, we don't want to see it because we don't want to think about that. But then once we get into that marriage, sometimes after a short time, then you start to notice and people will be like, oh, no, they've changed. But, you know, when you look at, like, personalities and all the different things, nothing really changes. And in our Christian walk, it's the same. We come and we love the idea that Jesus is coming to our lives and we, you know, take him on board. And then we felt like, yeah, but then God changed. You know, then he, I don't know, he just, you know, it wasn't the same, but it isn't. It's about us coming in sacrificially. And so sometimes I think the biggest thing that we find quite sad, so we offer this course. And then once we've done that course, what we say is we will then offer you ongoing mentoring. Okay, not counselling because no one likes to be counselled. Ongoing mentoring, which means, you know, any time, you, you know, you can come back and we can just chat about things. We can grab a pizza and just, you know, chat about what's happening. And yet it, it's amazing that majority of people are just like, yeah, I've done the course, ticked it off. And yet in all my years, I've never met a guy who said like, oh, yeah, I bought this car and I got it serviced when I first got it. And so now I don't have to do anything. 
It's like, it's, I filled it up with petrol when I first got it and it's going to be fine. I've never heard a girl say, that's okay, I got my nails done when I was 18 and my hair done so I don't need to ever do it again. They're going to spend so much money maintaining their cars, maintaining their, their, you know, their bodies, the, the gym. You know, you don't go, well, I, I went when I was 18 so I'm now covered. You know, but the fact is we'll do it in our marriage. Like, well, yeah, well I did the course. Is that... Is that not enough? And we're like that in our Christian um, lives. So like, well, yeah, I said the prayer. You know, that, that should be enough. You know, you just, you know, God's just lucky to have me. You know, he just, he just needs to realize. And we can be like that in our marriage. The same, well, you, they're just lucky they've got me. And at no point do I want to be, be mentored. And the only time generally people want someone to be mentored is when they're going to drag along the other person and say, well, tell them what they're doing wrong. But really, we should want to be, um, you know, mentored in our life and just know that I, I, I want to be moving forward. Because what we see in most relationships becomes complacency, becomes familiarity, and we just get used to, well, you know, that's just what it is. And so many people will be like, you know, they'll tell you things like, when the honeymoon's over. And yet, if you really understand what it is to be mad, the honeymoon should never be over. The things shouldn't actually change. And I know that some people here are already struggling with relationships. I'm not saying that um, the relationship, but when as you go through this message, if you think about whether it was you or whether it was them, I can't really say I was living a sacrificial life or they were giving a sacrificial life. And when we look at our Christianity, it'll be the same. Anyone that you know that was walking with Christ and is no longer here, God didn't change. They decided, you know what, I don't want to live a sacrificial life. And so, you know, our concern would be that we get into relationships, whether it's with God or whether with someone, and we're really not prepared to know what it is that person wants. When you think about love, love to a person is this, to say, what, what is it that makes them happy? So when I first became a Christian, I believe that when you do, you marry Christ and I married Christ and then the scary thing was, again, I probably thought he's pretty good to have me, you know, like I'm pretty good catch, God, you know, you've got me and, and uh, forgetting all the things that he did for me, laying down his life and then I started to read his love letter to me and I started to realise all the things that might displease him, all of the things that I might have to change in my life. And at no point was God going to go, well, I'm just so blessed to have you, so I'm just going to rub out some of those things and change it. The whole aim was as we love him and as we give in to him sacrificially, as we read this, it's not about fighting with God. It's about actually going, well, I love you so much that I will honour you in my relationship with you. So our question would be, and maybe in your Christianity as well, what led you to Christ? Was it love or was it lust? Was it love or was it lust? Let me tell you what lust is. Lust is self-seeking. Lust says, what can you do for me? Love says, will you meet all my needs? And love demands its own way. Often that's us. We come into a relationship with Christ and it's, it's about lust. What will you do for me? When I hear Christians say, well, you know, if, if God's so okay, why are these things happening? Why, you know, why it sh he, if he loves me, everything should work out good for me. And so we desire to have him. This is a story in 2 Samuel chapter 13. You can read it later. 2 Samuel 13. It's about a guy called Amnon. And the Bible says that he loves his sister Tamara. And it says that he, he loves her so much. But he gets her and the Bible says that he rapes her. And once he's had her, he says... I, it, the Bible says he hates her more than he ever loved her in the first place and he banishes her. And there are many people today who've called themselves Christians who've banished Christ because they loved him for a time and a seat. If I just have Jesus in my heart, he will get me through this and we've loved him. And could I even say we've raped him, we've abused him and then we've banished him to go, you know what, I don't want you in my life anymore because it was about my needs. Wow. And yet there's something so different. Love compared to love is this. Love is so different. It's laying down self. A heart's desire to serve. That's how we should be with Christ. Even Jesus himself, when he was uh, going to be nailed on the cross, he said, not your will but my will be done. 
And so if we really are true followers of Christ, there has to come a place in our life that we will say, not, your, not my will, but your will be done. I love you enough that I will follow what you've told me to do. Everything in the worship was about that, about becoming grateful, grateful for what he's done, grateful for who he is and what's happened. In 1 Samuel 25, we read the story about Nabal. And Nabal, you know, the Bible says that he's a fool. I think often when we fall out of love with God, we become a fool. And Nabal, when David's men come, David's men have protected him and they say to Nabal, you know, we've protected you and Nabal doesn't want to help him. And Nabal starts talking about all the things, you know, why should I have to give up this and that and why should I have to, uh, you know, follow you and feed you. And yet I love his wife Abigail. His wife Abigail, who was married to Nabal, obviously, is so aware of the protection of David. The Bible says that she loads up a donkey and she goes running after him and she comes off a donkey and she kneels at his feet and she's just so thankful for the protection of Christ, of David. Our question would be to ask, how often have we done that? How often are you prepared to get off your horse and go and just kneel at Jesus and say, I thank you for your protection. I thank you that you, you love me. I thank you that you're there for me. With Nabal, and I hear this so often today in 1 Samuel 25 verse 10, Nabal in 1 Samuel 25 10 says this, and Nabal answered David's servant saying this, who is David and who is the son of Jess? There are many servants today who break away from their own masters. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat and then kill them for my shearers and give them to your men that I do not even know where you are from? We hear that saying all the time. When's my time? Yeah. I need some me time. And this is neighbor, it's about me. I don't care who you protect me. I don't care what you did for me, Jesus. I don't care that you died on the cross because it's about me. Yeah. I like this boy. I like doing this thing. I like doing those things. I like saying these things. And so I, why should I have to take my time? Why should I have to take my money? Why should I have to take my things and give them to you? Because we want to be Abigail's church. We want to know what it is to be in love with Christ and just come and just go, you know, I just love you, Jesus. Whether you've done all the things that I want you to do, I don't want to become complacent in what I'm doing. I'm going to need to ask myself, what sort of relationship do I have with Christ? And who's actually the boss? You know, Jesus paid the price and we forget that. We understand that he paid the price for us so that then he owns us, that we, we become one with him. This is the same issue in a marriage that, you know, one of the things we try and teach people, it's like when the two become one, two people can't walk through the door at the same time. We're going to have to come together and be attached to him. Often there's a breakdown in communication. When we're, when we're thinking about my needs, again, in a relationship, it's because we're not hearing what the other person's saying. Right. You know, what, what is God saying to you right now? What is your partner saying to you now? You know, often I hear people say, well, they need to say what they mean. But really, do we want to hear what he's saying? Well, it's so obvious in the word of God what God is saying, but we've got to want to hear him. And in a marriage, this is what happens. We just stop hearing what the person said. I don't, I don't understand what you're asking me. You just say it more clearly. But the question is, have I stopped listening? Have I stopped listening? We see in those early days, you know, you can hear one thing and it's like, oh, I know that's what, what's important to him and I know that's what uh, he loves. And we go out of our way at the beginning. But then we get complacent to go, you know, I don't really want to, I don't want to hear and when it comes down to it, when we're looking at ourselves, you know, there was a story once about a couple that went to see a counsellor. And the counsellor's just sitting there and for the first hour, all these people did was just whinge about, well, she said this and she does that. And, and the counsellor's trying to give advice. He kind of wonders why they even can for counselling. I've been my, there myself sometimes because I think the whole, the best way for counselling is for you to improve yourself and as you change, the other person will change. And the counsellor's just sitting there while these two just bicker and bicker against each other. 
And so finally he gets at one point, he just gets up in there. He's so frustrated. He walks over to the wife. He totally gives her this amazing kiss, like really knocks her, you know, kisses her. And the guy's sitting there and he said, that is what she needs three times a week and you won't have any problems. He said, that's great. I can bring her Monday, Wednesday and Friday. See, often we're the same. Someone else has got to have the answer. If that's what it is, but that love, that love to go, you know what, I, could, I just had to break it up with a bit because it was a bit tense there for a minute. You know, it's like, do we want to hear? If you were to go for mentoring, if, if, whether it's with your kids, whether it's with your, your marriage, whether it's just in your life in general, would we want to hear what they say? Or would we kind of have that same sort of attitude? We'll just bring it. Because often we don't want to hear because it causes a change in our life. This is what happened with Moses. I love the story of Moses after the Ten Commandments and he's having this incredible encounter with God and he's just so excited about this. And Moses' people say to him, look, you just, you just go and hear. There's thunder and lightning and, and Moses is like, that's okay, this is great because God's just testing you. And they're like, fine, we don't want that. You go. You go, because often we want it to be someone else. Someone else go get the word for me. Someone else go spend that time for me. Because I don't know that I really want to do that. That intimacy. You see why people are loving to do church online, because I don't really have to do anything then. I can just, you know, watch it when I want to, and I don't have to make any effort. And we're like that in our relationships. We don't want to make any effort. If I've got to say sorry, maybe I'll just flicker a text then, or maybe I'll send an email. And yet there's something so much better in person to be able to go, I'm really sorry I, I said that. I, I shouldn't have said that. Remember a while ago I told you the difference between saying sorry when you're sorry is attached to why you're sorry. Which isn't sorry because you're a pain. It's <laughs> sorry because I, I shouldn't speak like that. It's ungodly. It's not, it's not producing good things in my life. This is why our walk with Jesus is so similar to a walk in a marriage. When you watch someone get married, you know, like as they're walking down the aisle, the only thing on their mind is the person that they're marrying. They're just so excited about what's happening and that, that's where their focus is. They're, you know, there's that sacrificial thing to be like, yeah, I'm just going to give up my life. But the sad thing is it doesn't seem to last very long. The laying down of our life. Love is to be sacrificial. The aim would be that it would benefit the other person. Some of the things that it is, is willing to give to them, willing to give up for them, and willing to give in to them. That's, that's what true love is. When we get to Christ and go, I'm willing to give up these things for you. I'm willing to give in to you. I'm willing to give the things that you need me to do. When I care more about your needs, Christ when I care more about your word than anything else in this world. This is what we need to think about as we come and say these prayers. And when we understand this, it's so awesome. You know, so many people are like so looking forward to getting married. But then when they look around, they see everyone else going, now I don't actually know I want to get married because if my marriage looks like that, there's not many marriages you can look at that go, I want a marriage just like that. And when you think about it, there's not many Christian lives that you look at that you go, I want to be a Christian like that. But it comes out of people who will lay down their life sacrificially to go, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to love God with all of my heart, for better or for worse, till death do us part. Ephesians 5, these will be scriptures that you know, but Ephesians 5 talks about for wives to submit to their husbands. And sometimes, you know, if you're a husband, you're like, yes, I agree with that. They should just submit. But you've got to kind of look at some of these words. Wives, submit to your husbands, which actually the word means adapt. But it says that Christ, as Christ is subject to the church. And wives are to respect their husbands. Just a side note, you know, when things go a bit wonky like that, do you know, oh, I won't even go there, but if you don't have a husband and wife, then you're not going to have submission and love. You're not going to have respect and love because... Yeah, it doesn't work. But it says for husbands to love your wives. See, it's so easy for me to submit in my marriage when my husband loves me like Christ loves the church. And it's so easy for him to love me if I submit to him like Christ did. And when you've got that circle happening, 
then things are going to work. When we understand what it is to, to do those things, when, when you can be a man, I would encourage you, don't enter into marriage if you are not prepared to love, like Christ said in the Word, to lay down your life. Lay down your life. And women, don't get into a relationship if you're going to find it hard to respect them. Respect them and honour them and be aware of what you're speaking about them in public and in private to, to be lifting them. And don't step into a relationship with Christ if we're not willing to love and respect him and submit to him. It's a growing thing. The more that you love someone and it should be ongoing, and again, Pastor Tom just said that in communion, uh, when we first become a Christian, I'm not saying you've got that undivided you know, love, but it, it should grow. And this is it, and it should grow in a marriage. People should fall more in love as time goes on, not more out of love. Because the question was, if when I started it was lust, then as soon as my needs are not being met, I'm not happy anymore. But when it's about me going, I'm just going to submit the way Christ, I'm willing to lay down my life to do those things, we would see a huge change. At Kids Church, at Kids club this week we were teaching them about holy is the lord you know sometimes we sing things when you've got to explain to a child what holy means it's very different but i see that holy just understanding this is even why we come to church and we worship because he is holy he is awesome he is he is to be reverenced and when we understand that it, it changes what we do we see this with david there's a place in david's life where he has kind of got a bit I don't know, uh, familiar, I suppose. In um, Chronicles, in 1 Chronicles, it tells the story about um, David when it's time to move the ark. And so, you know, again, sometimes like David loved God, but it, it says that he doesn't inquire of God. He just decides that he's going to uh, grab the ark, which has been um, at um, someone's house for 20 years. But David didn't seek the Lord on what he should do. And that's where we need to be, whether it's in your marriage or whether it's in your walk with God. God, what do you think I should do? We need to be seeking him. Just take that time out. You're not going to do that while you're scrolling through Facebook. Oh, yeah, God, if you've got something you need to tell me. Or you're not going to get that while you're at the gym. You're not going to get that while you're, you know, out at the dome for coffee. That's a time where you're just going to stop and say, God, what do you want me to do? What are you speaking to me? What are you speaking to me? So in 1 Chronicles 13 uh, verse 7, we see the story of uh, David going to move the ark. And the Bible says that he, I love this when I was thinking about it from a marriage. The Bible says that he puts the, the ark on a cart and, you know, he's just like taking it. You know, that, that's like a marriage where you go, okay, well, it's Valentine's Day. So just flowers and chocolates or something just to keep her quiet. You know, there's no thought put into it whatsoever. And... If your wife likes flowers and chocolates, that's great. But, you know, it's just that time is one of the reasons we don't celebrate those things because it's like if he's only going to show me once a year that he really cares, that's like a concern. And if it's to, to go and just get something... And it was interesting, I was saying to Tom, recently my kids were saying to me like, oh, you know, because they were telling someone, my mum's not really into gifts and stuff. And I was saying to Tom, I actually do like gifts. I do like gifts, so feel free to give me. No, but seriously, but it's a gift that shows you thought, and this doesn't mean everyone go do this, but I've got a couple of precious people in church who know like I love chocolate licorice, and I might go home some Sundays and I open the church box and there's, a, you know, I'm like, wow, that is love. That is love. But if you buy me a bunch of flowers, kind of go, okay, you obviously don't know me very well because... I'll be, I'll be blessing someone. I'll be gift giving that on this afternoon. You know, so love is when you actually know what the person really likes. And this was what was happening with David. David had a task he needed to do. It's Valentine's Day and I've got to get a gift. Okay. But David doesn't inquire. Like, I wonder what she would really like. You know, guys, I want to encourage you when it's a... And women. If it's a birthday, if it's a whatever, don't decide an hour before on the way home... <laughs> You know, I heard this guy once that brought this card and it was actually a sympathy card, but he was just, you know, racing, you know, to just grab anything. And so God's going, I don't, you know, and don't do that in our Christianity just to race, just to be able to, to do that. 
It's got to cost us time. It's got to cost us money. It's got to cost us thought. And the Bible says that in the story in Chronicles that they stick it on an ark and the Bible says, and when it comes to the threshing floor, do you know the threshing floor speaks of a place of learning? And so the cart starts to wobble and Uzzah sticks his hand out to, and we all say, oh, how mean, you know, God just barbecues him on the spot. But, you know, if you go back and have a look, that ark had actually been kept in his house for the last 20 years. It was his father's house. And so sometimes we can be a bit like that. We become very blasé in our Christian walk. We've been around Christ for so long. You know, you come in and people are praying. You're just there yakking to anybody. And rather than go, wow, I'm at my father's house. I just want to honour him. One of the things I love, Keita and Joe teach, well, not uh, Parker, because he's too small, but when he comes into a room just to, to honour whoever's there and say hello. Well, that's how we should be with our Father. Amen. Come into that prayer time and I just, okay, I don't know how to pray, but I'm just going to just enter into your presence. Have that time with him that's so intimate and spend that time. So we see that this happens for this guy, but it's just because he's become complacent. So maybe in your marriage, maybe in your Christianity, you're struggling. The question would be, have you come a little bit complacent? You know, so many Australians own more than one Bible and yet other countries try and memorise one page because it's illegal to own a Bible. And we become so complacent, we don't even pick it up. We don't even look at it. Most people can't even be bothered carrying a Bible to church. It's easy just to chuck him on my phone and just... You know, that's fine. You can do it on your phone. But do you, do you know, it's about understanding who he is and that intimacy. You know, if, if you're here and you've got your Bible on your phone, that's fantastic. But if you get distracted and while you're on it, you're sending a couple of emails to work and a couple of SMSs, imagine how you'd feel. It's not too many young people. Here. You're trying to make lo- love to your wife and she's sending a few SMSs, checking out Facebook and she's just brought this great mat for this afternoon though. How would you feel? Come on, because this is where it's at. And yet we come into the house of God where we're supposed to love him and honour him and we're doing so many other things. Checking out what shoes she's got on and what he and I wonder where he works out and where are we going to Macca's afterwards and we just need to honour our father and be in love with him and give him that time. Is that too direct? Are we getting this? God will only put up with so much. You know, I imagine, it was interesting where I said the threshing floor. You know when you get married, I was just picturing this, when you get married, you know, they say like you carry your wife over the threshold. You know, that's, that's hard sometimes, you know. Imagine if you just said, hop in a cart, babe, we'll just get across the door. That's how we are with God. Like just hop in a cart, God, and we'll get you across the door. There's, there's a cost. What was supposed to happen is they carried the ark as you carry your wife across the threshold, it, it's so many different things are involved in that. But there's something to say. Our Christianity is going to cost us something. Our marriage will cost us something. There's a cost to have a great marriage. I want to encourage anybody here who's... Oh, we don't even like to admit. If your marriage isn't like, woo, like my marriage is, then I want to encourage you. Find some ways to, to go, how can I make this better? And it's not about fixing him or her. It's about fixing me. Moving him back into the centre of your life is so important. I I love this scripture and I'm just going to share this one. I'm going to share it in my, my version in a minute. But Hebrews 11 verse 24. Hebrews 11, 24, just while you're looking for that. We've got to know that, God, I want to have an intimacy with you. I want to, I want to have a... You know, my, my aim would be to have a marriage that people look at and want to have. You know, just, just this week, one of our kids said to us, you know, I just want to have a marriage like that. And that's how I want my Christianity to be as well. That my kids will look at it and go, I want to have a Christianity like you've got. I want to have a walk with God like you've got. You've got to develop that in your life. When we watch, you know, young ones coming in, Uh, to church now and and different ages and stuff. I want them to be able to look at people in New Life Church and go, I want to have a walk like that. There's something so special about those people. There's there's a joy in their life. There's When we uh, come into the kids groups or uh, um, youth groups and stuff, I want them to look at the leaders and go, wow, they got something that we don't have and that's what I want. I don't want them to look at our life and think of it like, I don't want 
what you've got. This is a great wedding vow. I'll read it in the thing first. It says this, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of the people of God than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt, he looked to the reward. Well, when we read scripture like that, sometimes I don't know about you, like, well, okay, don't know, didn't really do much for me. But I want to personalise it and I want you to personalise it not with my name but with your own name. So Hebrews 11.24 says this, By faith, Jane, when she became of age, you know, when you become of age is a place where you become mature enough to understand how badly you need Christ. By faith, Jane, when she became of age, refused to be called a daughter of the world. I want to get to a stage in my life, you know, I don't want to be part of the world. I don't really care that people don't invite me to things. I don't really care that um, I'm not the same as the world. I, I, I want to refuse to be called a daughter of the world. I don't want to fit in to the world. I don't want to be like the world. I don't want to be accepted by the world. I want to refuse to be called a child of the world, a daughter of the world. Choosing. Do you know it's our choice? choosing God's when you ask Jesus into your heart he doesn't go right that's it you now have to do this for me in my marriage I submit to my husband not because I have to submit to him but because I honor him and I respect him and I I love him and so I choose choosing rather to suffer the afflictions of with the people of God you know, I want to get to a side. Of, you know, if that means that people don't like us, I'm going to stand on this side. I'm going to choose this. But I like it. it says, rather than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. Do you know, I love it that it doesn't say passing, uh, like, like, uh, it doesn't just say passing sin. It says to enjoy. Do you know what? Sin is enjoyable. In case you didn't know, sin is actually really enjoyable. Okay? But we have to choose. It says there, to, it, I've chosen to pass those pleasures because we've got to choose. I don't, I don't want that. You know, even in my marriage, I've got to choose to not want to be in those things. She considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of the world. There are treasures in the world. You know, if you choose not to step over and be married to Christ, there are pleasures of sin and there are treasures in the world. But there are greater treasures. And the scripture goes on to say, because she looked towards the reward. There is such a reward of living a life and being married to Christ. There is such a reward for us to be married even in the natural when we move away from those things, when I choose to not be like the world. And I would love you to, you know, look at this scripture and take it upon yourself as like a, a vow that you would say to God, you know, by faith. When I became of age, when I became of age, I, I choose not to follow in the things of the world. I don't want to be associated with the world. But I'm going to choose to be with the people of God. And I'm going to choose rather than the sin of this world. You know, many people are trying to live. I spoke a few weeks ago, living in both worlds. But to understand, you know, when I talk about the sacrifice that we have in Christ... It's not really a hard thing. It's like saying the same as marriage. If you get married, you're going to have to sacrifice everything. Because we misunderstand what sacrifice means. Sacrifice is actually a great thing to understand. Because when we know how much Christ loved us and what he did for us, it's easy to say, I will give it all up for you. And when you understand what it is to sacrifice in a relationship and know that Christ will do amazing things for you, it's Christ that ordained marriage. This is why this big battle's going on at the moment. It's, it's ordained by God. God says that man should leave his father and woman should leave her father and mother and be united. God originally placed man and woman. There is something so powerful about it. But the enemy will try and destroy that as much as he can as much as he can. So, Father, we just thank you today. Father, we just ask, Lord, that every person here, Lord, Father God, that is married, Father God, would understand what it is. Father, they would uh, even ask their partner, how can I be a better wife or how can I be a better husband? How can I serve you more? How can I love you more? To have an open heart to even ask, is, is there anything I do that upsets you? 
Father, that their desire would be to lay down their life for one another, Lord, Father God. And we know that disaster comes when one is doing this and the other isn't, Father God. And this is when things go wrong. But, Father God, that they would be sacrificial marriages. I pray, Father God, for every marriage in this church, Father God, that you would strengthen. And, Father God, that, Lord, people would see that they are just so fresh and on fire, Father, with each other, Lord, so much in love with one another. And, Father, so much in love for you. Father, I'm aware of those whose relationships, Father, whose marriages have gone wrong, Father God. And we know, Lord, that, Father, that one, it will be one or the other. Or, Father, sometimes just both, Father God. And Lord, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So, Father God, I come against even the work of the enemy right now that would tell them they failed or whatever. But, Father God, you're a God of new beginnings. You're a God of new life, Father God. Lord, there is always new plans and new destinies, Father God. And Lord, even if we're not in a place, Father, I think of some of our elderly that have no plans of remarrying. But Father God, they would mentor and train our young men and women up to know what it is, Father, to be great men and women of God, Lord. I pray for every young person, Father God, and every older person, Lord, desiring to be married. Father, that they would desire love and not lust. Father, lust never waits but love will true love will wait true love will assess a situation true love will really know what they're getting themselves into father before they make that decision father god lord even for you i pray father right now i pray for any person here lord that doesn't know you father you are the best husband in the whole world father i know that there are many here that haven't been loved by a mother or a father lord many who've been hurt by fathers, abandoned by fathers, mistreated, Father, by mothers and fathers. But, Lord, when we come into a marriage with you, Father, it's the best thing. I pray, Lord, that, Father God, you would lead them into a place to know the greatest thing is to make a decision to ask Jesus, your Lord, that you will always look after them, that you will never leave them or forsake them, Father God. Lord, there is such blessing of being married to you, Father God. And, Lord, as we prepare, Father, even for the end times, Father, it will be those that are married to you, Father, truly married to you, that will enter into the gates, Father God, will enter into the gates. Father, we want to be truly married to you, Father God, not just on a piece of paper but really in our lives, Father God, that we would wear, Father God, just obvious that we're already taken. Even when we're out in the world, and things are happening, people would know we're already taken by you. Father, we would be smitten by you. We would be in love with you, Father God. I pray, Lord, that we can be a great witness to our community, Lord, living a sacrificial life for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.